Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of IOHR TV. National security is often cited by governments as the justification for suppressing human rights. A recent report by Minority Rights Group International and the Ceasefire Center for Civilian Rights highlights how this excuse has again been used by the Iranian government. Under national security imperative, workers' protests have been violent put down. Any media criticizing the handling of the coronavirus outbreak has been silenced and even reports of human trafficking repressed. Today, we hear from Drury Dyke, author of the report and seasoned international advocacy expert on human rights in the Gulf, Iran and Afghanistan. Mr. Dyke, thank you for being with us today. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. You have written this report in the name of security human rights violations under Iran's national security laws, which analyzes grave violations of human rights in the country. What stood out for you? The Ceasefire Minority Rights Group report describes and sets out the evolution of the security framework, national security framework, from the inception of the Islamic Republic of Iran to the present day. But unfortunately, for the people of Iran, um, those security structures have neither been challenged nor reformed in any uh, significant way. And so the report looks very early on at uh, the establishment of the revolutionary courts and the the IRGC, the, the, the Revolutionary Guard uh, Corps, this, the, the kind of elite corps which is um, answerable only to the supreme leader. It also looks at the legal framework um, and establishes, of course, that Iran is a state party to international human rights conventions. But then, as a result of that national security imperative, that drive, we then go on to look at Really, who paid the price? How does this play out? How does this impact on society at large? Right. So how is the society impacted by the national security imperative? And who is the main target of the human rights violations you have outlined in the report? Human rights defenders, activists, people who speak out, labor activists, minority rights activists, people who are involved in specific professions where, where dissent or reporting the truth or some kind of truth may be involved. So by way of example, um, trade unionists. Others who are targeted include uh, people in the media. So every, almost every single Iranian person working at the BBC's Persian service, for example, um, has, has had their family targeted, they've been briefly arrested, or they themselves have been arrested. We looked at um, um, minority rights activists, Azerbaijanis, Kurds, Arabs, um, and also the unrest connected with, with, um, with socioeconomic concerns. I see. So what are your main conclusions from your research? This national security imperative, this drive to impose these sort of national security strictures on the people are really, I mean, not only do they backfire, but they result in massive human rights violations and a situation in which the country has repeatedly failed to adhere to its international human rights obligations and to its own obligations. I was particularly struck in the report by the grim phenomenon of migrant exploitation in Iran. I simply wasn't aware of the issue of Afghan and Pakistani migrants being trafficked and forcibly recruited as part of the country's forces in Syria. Who controls this human trafficking? The IRGC detained, arbitrarily detained, Afghans who had entered the country, uh, perhaps illegally, or indeed some of whom could have been in the country illegally, bundled them up and sent them to Syria to fight in, uh, a, in a military formation under the supervision of the Revolutionary Guard, which in and of itself 
constitutes a form of trafficking. They had no choice in the matter. They were summarily gathered and and sent off to um, sent off to Syria after a, a modicum of training in Varamin, um, in in sort of north central um, Iran. The fact that a state has resorted to trafficking in order to exert that national national security imperative is, you know, it, it, it's as shocking as it is, you know, sad. Yes, it is very sad indeed. Jury, how did you uncover the stories of these migrants? Very difficult to speak to any of them uh, myself, um, but it has been current in Iranian discussion groups, in uh, in in Western uh, European refugee circles. Uh, some of these individuals now are arriving from Iran and uh, and and some actually from Afghanistan or nor- or northeastern Iran. Uh, arriving into Europe, saying what exactly had happened to them. The promises were made um, uh, about what their future would be if they went to fight. It wasn't always fulfilled. Perhaps some were fulfilled in regards to citizenship and what sort of benefits they would accrue if they served um, fighting with the IRGC. Can you share an insight into the lives of these families, the impact on these families? Because some families have uh, have been ripped apart because they didn't know they didn't know that their you know uh, brother husband son etc had been taken away and actually may have died and then they heard about a burial through other people through other afghans suppression of protests the attack on freedom of expression and minority activism in the name of national security is not always carried out by the Iranian government, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, or IRGC, also plays a leading role in human rights violation in Iran, sometimes at odds with government bodies. What has your analysis shown of the evolution of the IRGC and the role it plays now? The Revolutionary Guard were crucial in establishing um, an elite leading military force um, in Iran to spearhead uh, many of the elements of the of the uh, of the of the uh, of battles in the Iran Iraq war between 1980 and 1988 whereas there were attempts under the presidency of uh, of Rafsanjani in the 1980s to bring it under one umbrella they did maintain their separateness almost as a separate standing force who is accountable or which is accountable to one and one authority only and it's not government and it's not the parliament it's only the supreme leader have the IRGC been sanctioned under the Magnitsky Act to try and make them accountable for the human rights abuses they have committed do you think this is effective the evolution of the Magnitsky, um, a Magnitsky style restrictions on individuals um, has not gone very far globally. By way of example, uh, between 2011 and 2013, the European Union has named 70 plus individuals plus one uh, firm, one organization, one company, as having been complicit in. Uh, gross violations of human rights in Iran after the election of um, um, then-President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. There, there is a move by, uh, there's an initiative by another organization called Justice for Iran, uh, which is campaigning for the designation of 35 individuals uh, for, in particular, the European Union, um, for them to designate these 35 individuals as kind of persona non grata, um, who should have nothing to do with the European Union in terms of travel or access to uh, any of its, you know, banking facilities or firms or whatever. There's there's talk that uh, that 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 some states are aware of it or thinking about it in order to levy impose these restrictions in advance of the November 2020 
anniversary of the November 2019, uh, that the, the unrest and of course the killings and to the mass arrests. Well, the European Union itself has not developed um, a formal Magnitsky uh, policy. The IRGC has also been responsible for the arrest and detention of dual nationals and foreign citizens. Although there have been some prisoner swaps between the US and Iran, there are still many being held in terrible conditions. As you know, IUTRA, like many NGOs, have advocated for dual national prisoner release, but with the US imposing sanctions on Iran, it is unlikely more will be freed. How do you see the cooperation among the US, Europe and Iran moving forward in relation to the cases of Ahmad Reza Jalali, Nazanin Ratcliffe and Anusha Ashuri? The Iranian authorities um, have not been shy, particularly, in stating that this has been considered um, a kind of living ATM. It's a bank. It's, it is a way of advancing uh, their interest in leveraging foreign countries' policies and just getting money, just getting ransom, just having blackmail of those individuals, just in order to secure additional funds. It looks clearly as if... Uh, um, all the authorities want, all the Iranian authorities want, is money. Um, in fact, J Javad Zarif, the Iran's foreign minister, has said, um, we can do a deal. We can do a deal about this. Lastly, as we were doing this interview in the midst of a pandemic, the report you authored has examined also how COVID-19 was seen not just as a health issue, but as a national security issue in Iran. Here, the national security imperative manifests itself again. Why is that? Coronavirus has been very difficult for every state to handle. But those individuals who have either expressed dissenting views about its origin, who have spoken out uh, disparagingly about it perhaps being from China, people who have said, uh, individuals who have, call, who have called out the government about its handling, of the virus. They have, there have been individuals who have been arbitrarily detained for speaking out about it. Drury Dyke, he has been a pleasure. And thank you for being with us for another episode of IOHR TV. From myself, Margita Kargasaki. Until next time, goodbye.